Church of Christ, and welcome to our October 31st recorded service. Uh, a link to the video and contact information for pastoral care will be included in the email that I send out uh, late today or sometime tomorrow morning. We are continuing to wear our masks for our service and once more spread out an open space between you and your neighbors as we continue to worship in our sanctuary. If you visit the building during the week, please bring your mask with you and wear it. If you're having difficulty hearing those speaking in the sanctuary, we do have hearing assistance devices in the cabinet to the back of the sanctuary for your use. So if you need one, you, I can go grab you one, or you can go back to the cabinet, whatever works. But we want to make sure that you hear the messages that are provided in, during this worship service. The community campus meal served 41 meals last Monday. Although the attendance has leveled off, new faces continue to come to the door every week. It is also not too late to make a donation either online or by writing a check to support Crop Walk. So you can write a check to the church and in the memo line put Crop Walk. Uh, or you can go online and the information for that will be in the email. Also of note, Sunday school class will start on November 21st at 9.10 a.m. and wrap up by 9.50 and we'll meet in the office. Look forward to seeing you join us. We're coming into the time for our stewardship campaign. Please take time to reflect on your relationship with our church and discern on what you might be able to pledge as your intent to give to our annual campaign. Financial support of the church is an ongoing need. Please make your checks and gifts payable to the Congregational United Church of Christ, and you can mail them to the office at 133 South Franklin Street, Whitewater, Wisconsin, 53190. If you are in need of pastoral care, please contact Pastor Dave McDonald at the cell phone and email provided in the message. Please continue to pray for those suffering in silence, for those who have lost loved ones, for their families, and for our country. And never forget that each and every one of you are a blessing to our church, and we are grateful for your support. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. A couple of uh, quick add-ons to what Pat had to say. If you look carefully at the bottom of the worship materials, you'll see I've got a new phone number. I got a, a 262 area code phone number now, so people will stop ignoring the 608 when it comes into their phones. Uh, so if you need to find me, it's a 262 number. It's actually a Delavan exchange, but uh, I got it as close to a whitewater number as I could get from Verizon. Secondly, there is coffee and, and treats uh, available after worship this morning. Uh, Marsha McKinnon was good to bring in some bars and things, and there's a big pot of coffee back there. So please feel free to stick around and grab a little bit of coffee and, and a bite uh, before you go, and uh, maybe even heaven for friend, engage in social conversation with the people who are here. Hi, Lori, how are you? Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Well, it's good to see you at the keyboard. It's always a good sight. <laughs> All right, if you are willing and you are able, would you please stand and join me in this morning's call to worship? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall gain mercy. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Rejoice and be glad. Great is your word in heaven. Greater still is the love of God. Let us worship and give praise and our invocation. Great and merciful God, on this day when we recall afresh the zeal of our reforming forebears who saw your church had become a creature of human meddling and greed, give us the zeal to love and serve as they did challenging what is wrong, being bold in our faith, and being fearless in service to you. 
Let our words and actions bring forth more true light and love for Christ's sake. Amen. You should have in your bulletin an insert, a mighty fortress is our God. On this Remembrance Sunday, we allow ourselves the luxury of remembering those from this community of faith, friends and family who have been called to their heavenly reward. We were not entirely certain when the last time we had one of these, so we went back to the beginning of 2020 to make sure that we remembered all of those who had died in the meantime. Let us pray. Almighty God, in whose eternal care are all your people, we remember again those whom you have called once more into your loving embrace. Bring comfort to all who mourn and encourage the dispirited. Help us in our remembering to acknowledge your presence in the midst of grief. By the grace of Jesus Christ, 
Have mercy on those faithful souls who now know and enjoy the gifts promised to all who believe in you. Remember too those who remain in this life amidst the sadness of loss. Have mercy on us, O God, and let us know that in our sorrow and in our remembering, you are here as you have ever been. Amen. And so we remember again these friends and members of the Congregational United Church of Christ. As I read each name, I invite you to respond with a hearty amen. Dorothy Nelson. Amen. Roger Helming. Amen. The Reverend Alan Crumholtz. Amen. The Reverend Wally Robeson. Amen. Mary Louise Lean. Amen. The Reverend Carol Ohm. Amen. Wilfred Rowe. Amen. Dr. Larry Nelson. Amen. Elizabeth Eker. Amen. Kyle Norton. Beverly Rell, Amen. those whose names are not known to all of us, but known in our hearts. Amen. Continuing, join with me, please. Holy One, now let your servants go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. With their own eyes, they have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Amen. Would you all please be seated. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Ruth, the very first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of their two sons were Malon and Shehalon. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. And these two took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chihlon also died, so that the women were left without their two sons and their husbands. Then Naomi started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and had given them food. And so she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. And they, she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, and go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they are grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And so Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you 
or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and even more as well, if even death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. The epistle lesson for the morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. This is a symbol of the present time, during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various baptisms, regulations for the body imposed until the time comes to set things right. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with their sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? And the gospel lesson appointed for this morning comes from the gospel attributed to St. Mark in the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so the scribe said to Jesus, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask Jesus any questions. This is the gospel and the good news of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The words are true and they can be believed. Amen. From the black hymnals, um, I have muffed the title uh, it is not the church's one foundation. It's, oh, Christ, the great foundation. It's the block of words. But I know you know the tune. So you've got the church's one foundation on one side, and then you have the words. We're singing the word block with the tune on the left. Number 387 in the Black Hymnals. Join me, please. Christ, the great foundation on which your people stand to preach your true salvation in every age and land. Pour out your Holy Spirit to make us strong and pure. Keep the faith unbroken as 
as long as worlds endure. Baptized in one confession, one church in all the earth, we bear Christ's own impression, the sign of second birth. One holy angel gathered in love beyond our own. By grace we are invited, by grace we make you known. Where tyrants hold his tight and where strong devour the weak, where innocents are frightened and righteous fear to speak, there let your church awaking attack the powers of sin and all their ramparts break. This is the moment glorious when Christ who once was dead shall lead the church victorious, their champion and their head, a sovereign of creation. Some of you are old enough to remember when that passage from Ruth was, was uh, put into song and had it sung at weddings. Anybody remember that piece being done at a wedding in their family experience? The idea that people joined their hearts and that they joined their lives and they promised to be together through thick and through thin. This is the story of a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. It's not the spousal covenant that we know of in marriage, but yet this passage is used. We used it at our wedding. I use it at most weddings that I conduct, frankly, because I think this passage says something about what it means to commit to hard work and challenging times and what it means for the people of God to see that God's hand in providence is at work in all that we are and all that we can be. What does it say when you have been willing to, to leave hearth and home that you have known from childhood to join with your partner in life's journey and go wherever that place will lead? And what does it mean as a faithful people to be unafraid of what that challenge will bring? In the course of a lifetime, people are caused to go lots of places. When I was uh, just an infant, my father was, I've told you before, my dad was a house painter. And he worked uh, for several years for a local factory as the, one of the painters on the crew of making sure the maintenance was done in the factory. And, and it, by this time in the early mid-60s, the factory's uh, task had begun to f falter. The, it, was just, it wasn't as productive and necessary for the place to be there. And dad would frequently get laid off. I don't mean all the time, but he would get laid off, especially in winter, and there would be tough times. After several years of this cycle, when mom and dad had five kids and, and were living in his parents' home after all the years,